So <clears throat> again, welcome everyone, um, and thanks for the introduction. Um, it's a humbling experience uh, to be here and to be asked to, to present here. Um, so today I want to share about um, my thesis, project thesis research, which was uh, design maturity from the perspective of design leaders. And uh, more specifically, I, did, I interviewed 10 design leaders in Finland, um, and um, I will be sharing what I found out in my research. But first a bit, um, first let me introduce myself. So uh, my name is Ondrej Zajic. Um, feel free to call me also Ondra, it's my nickname. Um, and uh, in this presentation, I will first introduce myself a bit more, and um, I will also ask Bayerka to share a bit about my experience of studying abroad. Um, then I will talk about um, the desk research that I did for my thesis, so existing studies about design maturity um, and maturity models. Then I will share a bit about how I approach the research uh, for my thesis, um, what were my research questions, how I set up the whole research, um, and then I guess the meat or the beef of the presentation, what I actually found out talking to these de 10 design leaders. And then finally some um, final thoughts and conclusions. Okay, so let's get started. So a bit about me, my background. Um, as Irka already said, um, in 2016, I, I, I went to this event. Uh, I, I looked it up. This is the screenshot of the Facebook event where I, how I found it and how I uh, went there. And um, frankly, this kind of changed my life because here I learned about UX design and I, I even found out it's a thing. And um, I forgot about it for like four months or something, but then I remembered like, ooh, there was that event. It was quite interesting. And I miss it, Cierka and, and Petra and um, then talked with them a bit more and then actually decided to do internship um, in LMC and then later decided to go study design uh, to Netherlands. So in 2017, I moved, um, I moved from Czech Republic um, to The Hague and I started studying um, bachelor's degree in user experience design. And I want to share a bit, some photos from the studies um, and tell a bit more about the studies. So um, to start with, this was maybe my favorite project um, in my bachelor's. Um, we were, um, our client was The Hague uh, Municipality and we were redesigning the, their atrium um, where the, the clients, the, the people came to for the municipality services. And this is during a brainstorming session. And my favorite thing about the studies was that um, we were, uh, even though it was in Netherlands, there were only a few Dutch people in the whole studies and we were mostly all internationals. So in this group, um, I was together, uh, my teammates were from Italy. Uh, there was one Dutch guy, but then there was a, there was a classmate from Germany and Lithuania. And um, among my classmates, there were also people from other continents as well. And um, this is our group. Um, we were creating this. Uh, we had like multiple concepts for, for the atrium, for the design, uh, how to improve it. But one of them was this kiosk. And we built this huge uh, cardboard prototype. And at this stage, we were just kind of trying to figure out how would it work and just using this prototype um, to see what, is, what would it even do. Um, and this is us at the actual Hague uh, Municipality Atrium testing the, we kind of brought this paper prototype, cardboard prototype there with a tram and um, we put it there and then uh, it was kind of attracting people and then we talked to the, this was the employee of the municipality and we are talking with her, how would it work? Um, and she was giving us feedback and we are also talking to some people there um, about it. So that, that was really interesting. This is another project, uh, another course. Um, this was a um, course called uh, human computer interaction technology lab. So it's the longest name ever, but uh, essentially what it was, it was a two week course where we um, we went to this, not into university, but to this form, former factory. And um, in groups, um, we were working on two weeks to build whatever essentially we wanted. Of course, there were some guidelines, but uh, there, and there were multiple themes and we chose the theme of playful interfaces and we were mostly working, the, the themes were around like Arduino, um, VR, and different kind of sensors. 
um, but basically to explore how people can interact with technology. And um, my group, we were working on a playful interface. This is us in the process of building it. And this is the final outcome, how it looked. Uh, we created this game where it was called Feed Us, and uh, people would throw plastic food uh, through these holes to kind of feed the characters. And um, essentially, we would there were sense Arduino sensors um, inside the hole. So whenever um, you would throw the food, it would come, come to point, and uh, there would be two people competing, throwing the food into their character. And uh, it, in the end, it would tell them who won. So that was another project. Um, and uh, this project was towards the end of the studies. This time, we, our client was not the Hague municipality, municipality, but the Delft municipality. And more specifically, we worked with the city planners. And um, we were designing an um, interactive table for these city planners um, to, be, to facilitate the discussion that they had when um, planning the zoning of the city and planning different buildings around the city. Um, and this was a really funky project. I don't know how we made it work, but essentially what it was is that uh, th you can see there are these tokens. Um, here is just one, but we had multiple. And the idea was that you would interact with the table with the token, so you would kind of, it was an interface that you would control with these tokens. And uh, you can kind of notice that this, this is a, like a plexiglass on top and a little sheet of uh, semi-transparent paper. And we would project uh, the image on it with a projector from the bottom. And then we also had a camera from the in the bottom that would kind of look up to the table, and the um, tokens had like a little QR codes from the from the top, uh, sorry, from the bottom. So the camera would kind of see the QR code and its position and rotation, and then um, you would kind of uh, it would see how the token is moving and it would control the interface. And we somehow made it um, made it working. So that was kind of um, interesting. Um, and this is the same course. Uh, this is our classroom where we were working in groups, and uh, each group had their own board. And we were also in this course. We were also learning to use Scrum, so we had our Scrum board there. Um, and this is the last image I will show from my bachelor's. Uh, this was uh, this was from a course called UX and People. And in this course, we were our task was to build an empathizer. What is an empathizer? Empathizer is in in this course, it was like an experience that we designed for people to understand specific target group. So our target group was uh, people with autism. And we are trying to create an experience that would allow people to understand how it feels to have autism. So essentially, we created like a grocery shopping experience. You can see this is a 100% real grocery store. And uh, you would have, uh, we would have different items there. And then when the person came to experience the empathizer, uh, we would give them headphones with very loud music, and then we would give them a shopping list, and we would tell them, okay, now you have two minutes, and you need to get all these groceries. And then they would run and try to figure it out, and we, then we would come to them and say, do you need something, do you need something, do you need something? And that way they were kind of experiencing the uh, sensorial overload that uh, often people with autism can experience, and they uh, hopefully they kind of got a feeling a bit how it feels to, to have autism. Um, so this was... This was our um, our dark group, but then there were also um, other groups. So for example, um, I think there was some kind of anxiety. Then also people with Alzheimer, and then they were creating these these empathizers to kind of understand different target groups. And uh, in 2020, I, I finished my bachelor, and I was uh, I wanted to continue with my masters. And um, now you could see that uh, we did all kinds of projects, but still a lot, I didn't show it maybe that much in the pictures, but still a lot of the projects were focused on building um, interfaces in terms of like webs or um, apps. And I was thinking I don't want to um, be creating just these interfaces. I want to kind of be involved earlier in the process and have better idea of what is the, what is the bigger picture. And I thought that service design is, is the answer, so I was looking for different masters that would kind of allow me to uh, dig more into in this direction. And I ended up going to uh, Finland, to Aalto University, um, where I did also the thesis that I will be talking about. So when I moved uh, to Finland in 2020, uh, you know, it was just after the pandemic started. And this is where I <laughs> spent most of my time. Um, all the courses were online. So um, most of the days, I would sit in front of this computer and uh, watch Zoom lectures. Um, go into break, um, breakout rooms, work in the middle. Um, but because 
all, all the school was online, we kind of, and most of my classmates or half of my classmates were internationals who just came to Finland and didn't know anyone. So we kind of, we of course wanted to um, also do other stuff than just sit inside Zoom lectures. So um, I was very lucky that a lot of my classmates um, were uh, active and we, we hung out quite a bit and made the most out of this Corona time um, by hanging out at different um, people's houses. And uh, here you can see that we were playing the game where you write a uh, fiction, like a character, and you put it on people's um, forehead, and they have to guess wh what is the name of the character. Um, this is uh, from, um, from one course from the master. Uh, this was a course called Design for Government, where we actually worked with one of the Finnish ministries. And this, this was my group. And um, what we did is because still the school was online, we um, decided that each week we will meet at different, uh, different members' place. So that way, each week you could still work as a group together in person because it was just a lot more fun than the school. And since we were four people, it was quite safe. So, um, so that's what we did. And I, I was really lucky that I had a really nice uh, group of people. And what I also really liked about um, what was different in the masters than in the bachelors, that in the bachelor, the group projects were just me and my classmates. So all of us studied the same. But here, um, this course, most of the courses, they were open to uh, people from different programs. So here, um, I was the one with the background in user experience design. But for example, um, another classmate, she was studying uh, creative sustainability, which is also a lot about service design, but more with a, with a s focus on sustainability. Then Seni, she was actually, um, she was a business major. And then um, Naijuan, who was there on exchange, he was um, from China, he was, um, he was also, um, his major was also in design, but more focused on urban planning and so on. So it was really interesting to work with people from with different perspectives and um, also learn how, as a designer, I can communicate in design projects with people with different backgrounds. This is how it looks in, <laughs> in winter in Finland. Uh, this is in front of the student accommodation. Um, and this was the first course that we had in person. Um, it was in the, in the beginning of the second year of the master's studies, and um, this was a course called Designing for Services, where we again worked with a municipality um, client. I don't know what is the thing with municipalities, but um, we worked with a, a city of Espo, uh, and this is a workshop that, that we had where we, um, in, the, in the course, our group created, um, we of course did some research, and. Um, and to talk to the users and uh, and the, the um, and the city people, but then we created a concept. Our outcome was a concept, um, and this is a workshop where we had multiple different concept ideas, and we were um, uh, we were talking to the we invited the people from the city of Espo to come uh, to our university, and we booked this room and we put these different storyboards of different concepts on the wall, and then we were validating the concepts and getting their feedback. So this is photo from that session. And then um, one nice thing about Finland is that um, I would say it has a really active um, uh, student social life. Uh, of course, the COVID kind of messed it up a bit, but um, still the associations, they organize a lot of events. There is a lot of student associations. And um, I was actually also part of one, uh, part of a board of one association. And we, there is this annual event that is organized for the whole School of Arts, Design and Architecture. And uh, each year it has a different theme. And that year it was the theme was a DIY Space Dream. And everyone dresses up um, according to the theme. And um, it's a big event. So, so I'm really happy that there were also a lot of um, social events like that. And this is the last project I will show from my masters. Um, most of the time I was focusing on projects with about that were about service design, strategic design. but um, this one, I, I, I took a different course, and um, we actually were building a physical aid tool for people with cerebral palsy. And uh, people with cerebral palsy, they have a problem with their uh, controlling their motorics, uh, like with motorics and controlling their hands and having a precise um, control of their fingers. And they need to exercise their fingers. So we designed this tool that would allow them to uh, practice different uh, hand movements. And uh, this is. Actually, we were testing it um, uh, in the middle. That's my uh, group mate. But then um, there is also a person with uh, cerebral palsy testing this tool. And there is a physiotherapist who works with people with cerebral palsy. And 
um, it was really nice that we were able to get um, their feedback and you can see that the it was interactive uh, tool so it was connected uh, to this <laughs> really messy Arduino prototype that was connected to the computer and it was giving some feedback with flights and again I did most of the my projects with um, with very abstract service design but this time I, I got to spend some time in the in the workshop and w in the mechatronics workshops and I was doing soldering and soldering LED lights together so that was that was a um, kind of break from from usual stuff and uh, this is a photo from the the very end of my studies um, in the summer um, when after I finished my thesis and I, I finished my research I um, together with Pia, who is on the left side, who was my thesis advisor, we organized a session for um, design leaders. And I was talking about the same thing as I'll be talking about today, the, the findings from my thesis. And um, I was sharing the findings, and they were saying their faults, and we were just having a discussion. It was a really nice closer of the, of the research. OK. Um, so now I want to set up a bit expectations when I will be talking about this topic of design maturity. Um, so in this presentation, you already saw how maybe a, li a little glimpse of how it feels to study abroad. Um, and hopefully you will learn a bit more about design maturity. I assume that a lot of you are quite familiar already with this concept, but hopefully you will still get, you will still learn something new. And my main goal today is to get you thinking. Um, Hopefully you will see some, um, this will spark some thoughts and um, maybe some questions for you um, about design maturity. And um, hope, hopefully you will also learn how others, the, the people that I interviewed, how they increase design maturity. But I want to also give a bit of a disclaimer. Um, I am not an expert uh, in terms of practitioner of increasing design maturity. I'm a student who just did the interviews and I talked to people who are doing it, but I don't have that much experience of increasing design maturity or measuring design maturity myself. So in this presentation, I will not give you like a manual how to increase design maturity or a manual how to measure design maturity. Um, but now let's talk a bit about how I get to this topic. Why did I choose this topic of design maturity for my thesis? Um, I had some already uh, at the end of my master's studies, I had some experience of uh, working as a designer. And um, during this experience, I had kind of a realization. I, I started thinking that design maturity really um, influences my well being as a designer and the impact I can have. Let me explain a bit. So, if we think of design maturity as um, the higher the design maturity, um, the, the more design is valued in the company and the more uh, design is involved in the strategy of the company, then, um, then I as a designer, I can have a bigger impact and my work is valued. And that I believe influences my well-being and, and the impact I can have. So I started thinking, like, how does it happen that a company becomes a design major? If I work somewhere, can I make the company more design major? Um, and how, how does this process work? How does it happen? And I, I started my thesis with this question. And um, in, at Alto University, uh, the thesis process works that you have a supervisor and an advisor. Supervisor is, um, is a professor from the university. And that's a person who uh, will approve your topic, who will grade your thesis in the end, and who, will, who is kind of like the former, uh, sorry, formal person yeah, doing the approvals. But then you have also advisor, who can be a member of the faculty staff, but also can be somebody from the industry. And I was really lucky that Heidi, who was my supervisor, uh, she recommended me to um, ask Pia Hanukainen to be my advisor. And uh, Pia, um, at the time, um, she, so she is working at OPE, which is a big Finnish bank uh, with a um, team of almost 100 designers. Um, and at the time, she was uh, the heading the um, research, uh, design research part there. but. Um, Later, she also became the head of design at OPE, and she was um, already studying this topic of design maturity quite a lot. She, um, because she was also, before she came to OPE, she was also working at my university as a researcher. So she also had an academic background, and um, during her time at OPE, she was writing some also research papers uh, related to design maturity. So it was the um, kind of a perfect person to be my advisor. And together with Pia, we were thinking how should I structure my 
uh, thesis to kind of discover something new, to be able to research something new, but also kind of fulfill my curiosity of how does it happen that a company becomes more design mature. Um, but first, I want to um, ask you um, about, have you heard about design maturity? Um, and maybe to what extent? Um, if I, let me see, if I switch to Slido, uh, you can scan this QR code and uh, uh, you will um, get to Slido and I will, uh, there is there is a place for questions, so please, I forgot to mention this in the beginning, but please feel free to ask questions. There will be two Q&A &A sessions during the presentation, so I will try to answer your questions. Um, but now I will open a question there. So hopefully now if you open the link, you should be able to see this question and you can answer. I'm really curious to see um, have you, like, to what extent have you heard about design maturity and if you are discussing this in your workplace um, or not uh, and how often. So I'll give you a bit of time to see the votes coming. Yeah, I already see the votes coming in. Great. Okay, we have around 50 people. I think that's almost all of you. Let me wait, maybe five more seconds. Okay. I think I can show the results here. Okay, so most of you Sometimes, sometimes talk about design maturity in your workplace. Uh, Thirty-two percent, then twenty-six. Um, you have heard about it, but um, haven't um, haven't discussed it or haven't heard about it in your workplace. And then twenty-six percent haven't heard about design maturity. Um, and seventeen percent talks often about design maturity. That's interesting. Okay. Um, let me see, I will stop the question. So now there is again a place to ask. Um, <laughs> it's conducted by Sarah. <laughs> nope. Um, uh, so you can ask more questions here if you want. Um, but let me switch back to the presentation. And Great. Okay, so let me define a bit more design maturity. Uh, some of you haven't heard about it before. So. Um, design maturity or UX maturity, the overlap there is very big, so we, uh, I use these terms almost interchangeably. So UX maturity measures an organization's desire and ability to successfully deliver user-centered design. So essentially, the more the company is able to carry out user-centered design and the more there is buy-in for user-centered design in the company, the more um, design mature the company is or UX mature the company is. And it will be clear also later while I, where I, when I will be talking about design maturity models. Um, but now when I defined it, I want to talk about why is design maturity relevant? Because this is something I had to establish in my thesis. Why would people actually care about this topic? Why, how is it relevant? Of course, for us designers, we maybe want to have more impact and so on, but for the businesses, how does it matter? Um, and I kind of uh, came up with three points. Um, Design maturity actually benefits business, and there are studies about that that I will talk about uh, talk about more in a bit. But as I already mentioned, I personally believe, and this is my personal opinion, but I believe that high design maturity benefits designers uh, in terms of our well-being and satisfaction. Um, and I believe it creates purpose because uh, if we are really able to create user-centered products and services in our companies, then we are able to better help people and. Um, fulfill their needs, and I believe that creates purpose. So that was the first part. Um, now um, I want to talk a bit more about uh, the desk research that I did uh, for my thesis, the, what studies I looked at for about design maturity. And as I mentioned, these three things, why design maturity is relevant, uh, the first one is it benefits business, and I looked into some uh, studies. Uh, these are the four main ones. Um, that 
study this phenomena. Uh, there is not a lot of academic um, sources or studies about this, so uh, these are all uh, commercial or semi-commercial studies. Um, there is one from the fact, uh, the, um, the fact Finder report that is from the British Design Council already from 2007. Um, there is also study by IBM and by McKinsey, uh, and I want to talk. Uh, I want to show quickly the one from McKinsey in a bit more detail. So it was a study done over five-year period, and uh, McKinsey uh, were tracking 300 publicly listed companies, and they were recording their uh, design actions. And what they did is that they divided all these companies into four categories, like four quartiles, according to how much um, how much design was incorporated uh, in the company. So in the top category, they had 25% the tw of the companies that valued design the most and that they were using design the most, or um, that design was the most incorporated in their company. And then they had the other uh, three uh, quartiles of the companies. And what they found out is that the companies uh, in, the, in the top quartile, they had a significantly higher revenue than the companies, um, um, than the average of the rest of the companies. And similarly with uh, total return to shareholders, um, it was not double, but still significantly higher number um, of the total return to shareholders of these companies. So these are all the four studies. I will also, in the end, I will have um, overview of more resources if you want to dig into it more, and then you will see uh, exactly the name of all the studies. But my point here is that um, these studies show that the higher the design maturity, essentially the higher the business benefit for the company. So this is really powerful because this is like argument for us as designers um, to convince uh, the management of the company to um, see that this is actually a topic that is also in their interest, which is not always quite easy. Um, but moving on, uh, I also looked at the different design maturity models. Um, so. I don't want to, um, there, there is a lot of them. Uh, these are the four that I think are maybe the most significant. Um, so um, there is maybe one of the first ones was from 2001 from the Danish Design Center. It is a more simple one. It has only four steps. There is uh, maybe most of you, if you know some design material model, will know the one done by Niels and Norman Group. Uh, they created one in 2006 and renewed the model in 2021. And then also some of you might know this uh, study, huge study from 2019 by Envision. I'll talk about it in a bit more, but now uh, time for second question. I'm curious if you have used design maturity models in your workplace. Um, I will again open up the Slido and um, you will be able to vote again. So let me switch to it. Now you should be able to see the question there and um, you can put your votes there. Yes, a question. Mm. That's a good question. I, I think um, in this question I'm referring to a case where maybe you used it together with multiple people. So not just you reading about it, but actually like implementing it or using it to kind of assess your maybe situation or use it kind of thinking how to get to the next level. But maybe you used it together with more people, I would say that's, that's maybe the criteria. Okay, a few more seconds to put your answers in there. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, we have 45 votes in, so I think I can open the results. So most of you haven't used any model. Uh, then the one by NN Group is the most popular one. I'm surprised that some of you used the design letter because it's I haven't heard about it um, in Czech at least, and from anyone in Czech. Um, it's also the design letter is also done by the Danish Design Institute, so it's mostly known in the Nordics. Um, and some of you created your own custom model, so that's really interesting. Um, okay. 
let me stop the question. Okay, so I will just quickly talk a bit more about the models. So the design ladder, um, it's it's kind of the one of the first ones, and it's very simple. You can see that the first step is just basically there is no design. Then there is design as a form giving, so mostly for it's about visuals. The design is mostly understood as like a means to get things prettier. Um, then the next step is design is understood as a process, so maybe it's more. Um, research heavy, and then finally, the last step is design as a strategy, where maybe design plays a significant role in determining the strategy of the whole company. Um, then there is the model from um, Nielsen Norman Group, which most of you um, are probably familiar with. Um, I think this is the renewed one. Um, so again, it goes from that design is absent to the company is very user-driven. And the this is the Envision one. Um, you can see this is they had like five different levels. And what is interesting about this is that uh, how this model came to be is that they Envision conducted a research with over 2,000 respondents. And based on the data, they created this model. And um, they also kind of divided the respondents to the, to the levels they created. So you can see that most of the companies, they are at the level of one producers, where it's really about producing um, maybe specifications producing visuals, um, and then the least amount of companies is in the in the highest level. Um, so these models um, they can be of course used in different ways, but uh, one way to use them is to assess your own situation and then uh, kind of see how you can get to the next level. Kind of um, use them as a guideline to get to the next level, um, and now. Moving a bit to the other studies that I was um, familiar familiarizing myself with for my thesis um, when I was looking into different studies. Uh, there are two studies, one from the InVision and another one that were kind of uh, um, trying to understand where companies actually are. Um, so you can see in both cases, there is very little companies who are in the top where design is actually um, the driving force for the strategy in the company. Um, then there are some studies, and I think these are the most interesting ones, about increasing design maturity. So, um, yeah, one of them is integrating design into organizations, another one is elevating design into organization. These are academic studies. Uh, the first one is based on interviews uh, with 100 people, uh, sorry, 100 people from different companies, um, and um, I will also mention this research later. And then there is also one commercial one from, again, from McKinsey, uh, more than a feeling than design practices to deliver business value. So if you are interested um, into some more literature, how to increase design maturity, I really recommend, espe especially the first one. Um, then I also looked into some studies that are case studies about how specific companies went through uh, stages of lower design maturity to higher design maturity. And uh, the second one is from OPE, so this is done by my advisor um, together with her colleagues. And um, uh, I believe you can find it on the internet. If not, and you are interested, then just let me know or contact me. Um, essentially, in like I, I think 30 pages, they describe how they went from the early stages in 2000 to where they are now. In they, um, this report was written in 2018. How they got, how the company progressed, how this bank progressed from. Um, essentially having no designers to now having quite a big team. Um, and then also some studies I looked at, uh, they were about measuring the impact of design, uh, so different metrics that can be used to measure the impact of design, and um, this can be also used to evaluate design maturity. So now um, I want to talk about um, the actual study. Um, so again, first I will talk about uh, the research setup and how I went about doing this research. So um, I started by, um, or I didn't start, but in the beginning, I essentially had three main research questions of what I wanted to find out in this study. Um, and this was framed together with Pia, my advisor. So first, I wanted to understand how these design leaders, how they look at design maturity, because there, is, there are studies about you know, uh, where companies are, um, what are they doing to increase design maturity, but there is not a lot of 
um, research on how design leaders in the companies, how actually do they think about this topic? Are they using these design maturity models or not? That's actually my second question, what frameworks and metrics they are using. So essentially, are they, are they measuring design maturity? Are they using any design maturity models? Um, are they utilizing them? If yes, how? If not, why? And then with that, what are the challenges that they are facing in terms of increasing design maturity and how do they resolve these challenges? So that's what I was trying to find out. And in terms of the methodology, in the beginning, I wanted to accompany the interviews with also diary studies. Um, but after starting that with three participants, I scratched it because um, I wasn't getting any um, that much different data than the, from the interviews. And it was really kind of um, hard to do it because my participants, they are very busy people. And the diary studies, they required quite a lot of time from them. So. My participants uh, were from five different companies, each company from a different industry. Uh, and one important thing to say is that um, these were not startups. Um, these were not companies that started in the beginning with design teams. These were quite traditional companies that established design teams only in the last uh, five to 10, maybe 20 years. But these companies are way, way older. So they are, it's usually companies who work for decades. Um, and these are the industries and the participants and the role of the participants that I interviewed. So you can see there are companies like a uh, telco company, uh, energy company, financial company. And um, here you can see the different, uh, below you can see the different roles of the people I interviewed. Um, so there were a few heads of design um, from three companies, uh, but then there were people like design operations leads and also some people who are uh, the directors of uh, customer experience. But essentially all people from like design leaders. Um, so now when you know a bit more about the setup, um, let's look in the actual meat of the presentation, the findings. So I structured the findings into these five different categories. So I start with what is the understanding, what is the perception of design maturity of these leaders? How do they even approach this topic? How do they think about this topic? And then it kind of goes into two branches. One is about measuring design maturity and the design maturity models on the left. Um, and then the right branch is about the activities for increasing design maturity. What are the activities they do for increasing design maturity? What are the challenges um, uh, that they come across? And how do they resolve these challenges? So I will be talking um, in these five categories. So starting with the perception, um, well, most of the design leaders, they see design maturity um, in these two categories. You could see like two buckets of design maturity. One is about the design team, and the other one is about the rest of the organization. And here I want to come back to um, the study I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, the study uh, is called Integrating Design into Organizations. And what they um, find out uh, in this study, with, it's based on, again, the interviews with 100 professionals, they find out that um, there are kind of two axes uh, for that matter when you um, try to assess the impact that design has in a company. And as I was talking about the two buckets, well, surprise, this is the same thing. Um, one X is about um, the, the um, um, the y-axis is about the design skills. So how skilled are the designers in the company? And then the other x, um, the, it's about the, um, the rest of the organization. So how are they receptive to design? And you can see that um, if you don't have skilled designers and you, you don't have a buy-in in the rest of the organization, of course, you have low impact. But if you have, um, if you have a lot of the people in the company interested in design and you have wide, what they call widespread applications and scaffolds for design, but you have limited expert, the, you have limited deep capabilities of designers themselves, you have medium impact. But similarly, if you have very skilled designers, but you don't have the buy-in uh, in the rest of the organization, you also have only medium impact. So to really have a high impact, you cannot just, you need both the very skilled designers, but also you need widespread application and scaffold. So you need the rest of the organization to really um, 
um, be uh, have a buy-in for design um, and need to be familiar with a design methodology and so on. And then throughout the presentations, um, I have um, these questions in the in the bottom. I will not be reading them out, but they are kind of some maybe uh, prompt questions to um, make you thinking. So feel free to um, read these questions there on the next slides as well. So the first one is how to keep increasing design maturity in the design team and in the outer organization at the same time. Another thing that I found out is that the higher you go in the hierarchy of the design team, the more people are interested in design maturity, the, the more they are concerned with this topic. So the heads of design, they usually think, okay, it's my responsibility to really think about design maturity. How can we increase design maturity in our company? But for regular designers who um, are maybe not so high up in the hierarchy of the company, they are rarely that much concerned with this topic. Usually they don't think about it that much or maybe they don't think about it at all. Um, and now moving to the second section, uh, the perception of design maturity models and uh, yeah, measuring design maturity. So <laughs> it turns out that all the people that I talk to, they don't use design maturity models um, and they have different reasons for that. So um, some of the reasons is that they think that they just don't have time. But one of the main reasons is that I found out is that a lot of them thought design maturity models, they are kind of, um, you know, it's it's like a template, but reality is a lot more complex. We we don't see a point in using them because there are different, um, there are different parts of the company, each part in the company is different, um, and the model is just too simple. It never can represent fully the reality. Um, another, reason that I came across was that um, the leaders thought, you know, we already have mechanism in place to increase design maturity. We are already trying to do that, so we don't need to use the model. We are already doing this anyway. Um, so that were some of the reasons. And when I asked the uh, design leaders how do they kind of, um, how do they know where they are in terms of design maturity? Uh, well, they were saying that um, in most cases, uh, they were saying that you know they are not really convinced with measuring design maturity with very quantitative way. way. Um, they were kind of leaning more towards organic and qualitative approach, even intuitive. So they believe kind of in talking to the people uh, in the company and trying to um, make, the, uh, trying to understand the situation from that rather than sending out surveys and trying to put numbers to things. Um, and when I asked them about the models, um, often they said that, you know, they don't see the models useful for uh, really assessing and quantifying the situation, but they see them, um, they see their value in um, using them as a communication tool. So, uh, for example, there is this quote that I would like to read uh, from one person that um, that the person said: "It's a tool to open leaders' eyes to how those things progress and what are the benefits when you cro progress from step to step." So I came across multiple examples when they would say, I, I can take the model and it's something that I can show to the management of the company and I can use it as a tool to ask for more money or bigger budget or um, argument to um, move things uh, ahead. But what was kind of, um, when we talked about specific uh, ways how they try to increase design maturity and so on, it was interesting because contradictory to what I just said, um, some of the leaders, they really saw the importance of measuring success of their efforts. So for example, one quote, um, when we measure something, we are also broadening the awareness, right? So in this case, the head of design was talking that when you, when you set a goal and you put a metric to something, suddenly people start talking about it because they're like, okay, there we have this metric, how do we achieve this? It brings awareness, people start talking about it more. So when you put a metric to something, suddenly all the people start considering it is more important than before. Um, and another quote, we need to know if our efforts to increase design awareness are successful. So it's a, from a company where this head of design was trying to make the, the rest of the organization more aware of design. And um, they, they, uh, they were doing different activities to do that. And they, they established a survey to understand how people in the company, what is their perception of design, um, in order to understand are the efforts they are doing effective or not. 
So it's kind of interesting that some of the leaders, they really see this as important to measure the success of their efforts, but at the same time, they are not um, measuring their design maturity. Um, and when I ask them, how do you know where you are in terms of design maturity? How do, like, if you say that you are a certain level of design maturity, how do you know that you are that? And then they talked about different indicators. Um, so some talked about the number of designers they have in the company. Some talked about customer satisfaction. Um, some talked, well, we, I know that we are this major because we have these practices and these rituals in place. For example, um, we have these design demos for the whole company or um, we have this way of feedback and so on. Um, also, some uh, one person mentioned that um, the design maturity situation in their company can be kind of understood by how low is the threshold to engage with customers. So if it's really easy for anyone in the company to go and talk to the users and um, uh, do research with them, that's, that's how they know that they are in a good place in terms of design maturity. So even though they, when I asked them, they could think of all these indicators or metrics, none of them were kind of uh, intentionally using these metrics for assessing design maturity. So now moving what were the activities that they actually do for increasing design maturity. Um, and I don't have this question, I think. Oh, actually, yeah, sorry. So um, I will be now talking about some of the activities that the design leaders are um, doing to increase design maturity. And I want you to pay attention to these activities. And after I go over them, um, I will again run the Slido and I'll ask you which of these activities you think would be useful um, in your own work, in your own company. So again, these activities kind of fall in these two buckets, increasing design maturity for the design team or the design community, and then for the rest of the organization. So first, let's start with the design team. So one way of increasing design maturity is supporting designers, um, coaching them, providing guidelines. So one quote is, well, first of all, I want to make sure that all of our designers have the best way, the best possible setup for success. And in this specific way, uh, in this specific case, the, um, the head of design, she was talking about, you know, having having one-on-ones, having kind of coaching sessions with the designers so they can grow and um, yeah, improve. Um, another way of increasing design maturity in the design team was just the knowledge sharing. So um, in this specific case, uh, this respondent said, I want to establish some sort of like interest groups because there is no natural interaction with 50 people. So they had a situation, they had 50 designers in their company with all different kinds of specializations and they were struggling that there was, it was not very easy to share knowledge. So they were thinking to kind of break them up into smaller interest groups so they can, it's easier to share um, the interest and they can grow design maturity in this way. And then uh, the bucket of um, the rest of the organization, how to increase design maturity there, how are they doing it? So the biggest thing probably is educating non-designers about design. Um, and that could be one way, just creating awareness. Um, a lot of the companies, they actually had design trainings. They were running in the company internal design trainings, usually created by the designers. Um, and well, some of these design trainings, they had the goal just to increase awareness so that people even know what designers are doing, um, and maybe when they need to approach designers and ask for um, help with design work. But another way of doing it, maybe more in depth, was coaching and mentoring. So this was usually that they were sparring non-designers in specific projects and helping them with using design methodologies um, so they can actually uh, not just have the awareness and better understanding, but they can create skills to some extent by themselves. Then another way to increase design, uh, design maturity among non-designers is uh, you know, making design more visible in the organization. Um, so first, that's, it's kind of like two, um, two-way street. So um, one way is from the design team, so to really uh, creating um, awareness by you know, telling success stories, showing, talking about design projects um, in the organization and so on. But then also uh, it's about the other direction so that designers are and design team is approachable. So creating channels and removing friction that non-designers can approach designers and get help from them. Um, and another, another big factor that helps a lot is support from top management. So I want to read this quote uh, when the participant said, 
Well, our CEO said that we need to put more emphasis on customer experience because that is the most important. That puts everything in perspective on us. And um, since that moment, it gained momentum, you could say. So in this case, she was telling me a story that the CEO um, said it was a new CEO and then said, oh, we need to focus on customer experience. And suddenly, many people in the company that were maybe before hesitant to work with designers or that were resident towards designers, suddenly they were much more open to everything because they, when there was this message from the top, from the CEO, um, they were much more open to everything. Um, and now I want to um, go to the Slido and I want to ask you um, to vote um, on which of these activities you think um, would be helpful in your company. You can put uh, more votes, I believe. Um, so just select all the ones that you think would be helpful in your company. We have again almost 50 votes, so I will reveal the results. So most of you think that support from top management would be the most helpful, and then educating non-designers about design, making design more visible in the organization. So it's interesting that uh, mostly it's the things about um, creating awareness and increasing design maturity among non-designers. Okay. So now this is the uh, another section. What are the challenges that these design leaders are facing? Um, the biggest one is resistance towards design in the rest of the organization. Um, and that's also where a lot of the activities are focusing. Um, so yeah, one participant said, there might be people who have been so long in the organization that they think, I just want to do things my way. Another big... Um, uh, challenge is that some people misunderstand design and they, uh, even though they are not designers, they think they are designers and they can think they can do the same things as designers. Um, so that can create a lot of confusion and um, yeah, problematic situations. Um, then in one case it was about, um, in some cases it was about limited resources, either money but also time. Um, one example was also um, with product design that you know design doesn't really fit into the agile ways of working. So when there's a product team, um, there can be a tension maybe between the developers and designers uh, because it's hard to fit design ways of doing things into the agile ways of doing things. Um, and now I want to look into how the design leaders, how they resolve these challenges. So the first one, when there is resistance towards design, um, as I was saying already, um, they try to share success stories and create more awareness and maybe even more effective way, um, and this is kind of s similar to design trainings, they, they try to show design by working together and um, you know, maybe on a small scale first and then scale that up uh, because people can uh, really only see the value once they see it by themselves. So uh, there is this quote to illustrate it from um, CX director. People are not used to it, uh, meaning design, People need to see examples and learn by doing, and by doing, see the benefits. Um, and then um, another obstacle was that uh, lack of modern design practices in other departments where there are no designers, so they were trying to tackle this with you know, collaborating with them closer. Then um, another example was that uh, different roles have different agendas. So for example, business people, they really try to push for business results and don't care that much about user centricity and so on. So um, in this case, the participant was trying to you know, constantly communicate with them and create shared goals. Um, whether that was effective or not, I cannot um, you know, judge, but uh, this was what they were doing. Um, 
And the problem of limited resources, um, this participant or participants, they were uh, you know, trying to tackle this by creating goals for the design team. So um, maybe creating um, OKR, OKRs specifically for the design team. Um, another problem that stakeholders don't have time to collaborate with designers, so they were just trying to tackle this by finding the right timing. And uh, in one case, they had a lot of abundant data in the company they didn't know how to utilize. So they, they tried to tackle this by building strong stakeholder connections to be able to better interpret the data and better use them through, you know, through understanding the stakeholders and through the stakeholders being able to interpret better the data. Okay, now I want to share a bit um, the conclusion and my final thoughts on this. So these were the three research questions I had. Um, and I will just show how, uh, what are the answers, uh, wh what is the summary to the answers. So um, in terms of perception of design leaders, how do they perceive the topic of design maturity? Well, all of them, they won't hire design maturity, obviously. Um, and usually um, they see this divided into two buckets. Uh, design maturity is um, divided in design maturity in the design team and then the rest of the organization. And usually, the higher the role in the company, the higher interest in design maturity. In terms of the um, design maturity models, um, they don't use design maturity models, but they see them as communication tools. And they have some metrics, but they are not directly tied to design maturity. So they don't intentionally measure design maturity. Um, and in terms of challenges, the biggest challenges are, um, are resistance in the outer organization and uh, the lack of resources and kind of how they go about this is by showing design by working together and letting people try design methods and also communicating about design, educating about design. And to, when, when I look at this kind of, um, you know, at the structure of my findings, I would say that there is kind of this missing link because there is, there is a lot of these um, activities to increase design maturity and there is a lot of challenges and, you know, resolving the challenges, but there is really um, not that much evaluation. Are we actually doing it successfully or not? So I'd argue that there is a missing link to measuring the efforts. Um, and when I talked about this with my uh, advisor, uh, Pia Hnukainen, uh, in her company, they actually um, measure design maturity and um, they, um, they do it over quite a long time so they can also see how they progress. And I know it's also a case for more um, companies in Finland usually startups or uh, companies that uh, maybe started with design teams. Um, so coming back to what Pia said uh, is that when in companies you all mostly you have business goals and um, you know everyone focuses on on business goals but if we really want design to be um, to have the same focus uh, then we also need to have met uh, we also need to have metrics and goals for design. And as I said in the beginning, um, there is a clear business benefit for that as well. So um, a bit more maybe my personal lear learnings and takeaways from this. Um, for me, this was really nice project because um, I got to basically get to know 10 people who are design leaders in the industry and I get to know them and the way how they think. Um, and that was very valuable for me at the beginning of my design career. Um, and also, um, I got a little peek into five different companies. Like, how, what do they do about design maturity? This is a topic that is really important for me. I want to work at a company that really cares about design maturity and tries to push it further. And I got, um, I kind of um, created a benchmark for myself, like how different companies approach this topic. And then myself, after the thesis, when I started uh, uh, working in the industry full time, I could see, OK, the company where I'm working, how do they approach this topic? And how is it different than the companies where I was working? Um, and now I want to share a bit some resources uh, that might be helpful if you want to dig uh, into uh, some of these things more in detail. So feel free to take pictures. Uh, the presentation will also be recorded and posted on YouTube, I think, so you can also look it up there. Um, but uh, here are some of the articles about the value of design. Then uh, this is just the list of the different design maturity models. Um, and these are the articles about integrating design into organizations. 
Uh, I think these, as I mentioned, I think these are the most um, interesting maybe or val valuable for you. I will give you a, bit, a few more seconds to take the picture. And um, then these are the, on the left, that are the two individual case studies uh, about how, dif how companies progress from lower uh, design maturity to higher design maturity. Um, these are the, then the two articles about measuring the impact of design, um, and they talk about different metrics on different level of design maturity, so this can be also interesting resource for figuring out what could be the ways and metrics to measure design maturity. And then finally, uh, feel free to contact me um, if you have any questions or you just like to chat about this topic, then I'm really happy to, uh, to do so. So feel free to contact me either on my email, LinkedIn, and I even put Calendly link there. So if you want to um, talk about it in person, then I'm happy to do so. And also, if you want to check my uh, thesis, um, then um, it's available uh, at our university port portal called Autodoc. So if you Google Autodoc and then search for my thesis, you will find it there. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you um, for the time you gave me. And um, now I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, uh, so first questions. According to the presentation, design maturity seems to correlate with the democratization of design. Could maturity be increased even without democratization? I personally would say that um, it, I would come back to the, to the graph that I showed where you kind of have the two dimensions of design maturity. And I think you can increase design maturity to some extent um, without democratization of design, but I think to really reach the full potential, um, you need to democratize design. And by that, I don't mean that everyone needs to be a designer, because that's not even possible, but um, have an understanding of, uh, basic understanding of maybe uh, design methodology, uh, design thinking, and uh, people are, um, they want to collaborate with designers and they understand the value of design. So that's maybe what I mean by that. Um, another question, you focused on in-house design leaders. How is the dynamic different when design is outsourced to an external agency from your experience? Um, I don't have that experience, so <laughs> it's a bit hard for me to answer that question. Um, but I believe that, um, yeah, in agencies is very different. And um, there are, um, I think, also agencies that um, assess their design maturity in agency, and I think that's quite a different scenario, and I haven't looked into that, so I cannot really talk about it. Um, can you share with us your benchmark, please? <laughs> uh, I guess that's, I am guessing that's uh, referring to when I was uh, giving the personal reflection and saying that I created my own benchmark. Well, by that, I just meant that I kind of got a feeling of how different companies approach this topic, and essentially it's the things that I shared with you that I saw that some companies, they do like a full-fledged design trainings for, for example, project managers, all the project managers in the company, or they, essentially I saw that some companies are really in, invested in this topic um, and some are less, and then there are different activities that they do. And um, that for me was kind of the, the benchmark that when I came to a company, I could see what out of these things they are doing. Um, is there any list of companies and their UX maturity? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think the, I think the, um, the studies that I have um, showed, uh, the studies that uh, kind of show the graphs of how, what is the quantity of the, of the companies on lower levels, on higher levels, on the middle levels, um, they are anonymous. So I don't think there is like a specific list. At least I haven't come across. If you, if you come across such a list, I would be really curious to see it. Um, but of course, like there is the usually people give um, example that the companies, the most successful companies, like Facebook, Amazon, Google, all of these companies are, are really high on design maturity. Um, you have gained substantial knowledge about design maturity. What's next? <laughs> what is the next area of interest? Oops. 
Oops, oops, oops. Oh yeah, there it is. What is the next area of interest you want to dive into? Um, for me, right now, I just finished my master's, so um, I'm just trying to um, grow as a designer and learn. I started working um, up, up from September um, full time as a designer, so I'm just trying to, you know, um, really get more time working as a UX designer and um, get more experience because I think that's the most important part for me right now. Um, like eventually, I'm quite interested in this topic and how to help companies. Um, grow their design maturity. So maybe that's something that I want to focus more in the future, but I, I kind of think that at this point, I just need to kind of learn um, about the basics, uh, if you will. Um, have you, in your study or research, come across any critical approaches to measuring design maturity or applying the design maturity models when it's relevant? Um, maybe one example I could mention, I know that um, in one company, they were measuring um, design maturity. They had it outsourced. So InVision actually provided the service uh, where they would survey people in the organization and they would assess the design maturity of different teams and they would um, give the results to the company. So um, it was a paid service, um, but then um, I know in that company they could compare how different de departments are doing in terms of design maturity. And um, I heard that then even the business leaders of the different businesses, they were like comparing themselves to the other businesses. Oh, we have now, we have improved in the design maturity and they started um, be more invested in this. So that was quite interesting. Uh, but I, from what I uh, understood, they don't, Envision doesn't provide a service anymore. Regarding the companies, how did you manage to get in touch with these design leaders? <laughs> Good question. Um, so some, I just thought that they are interesting companies and I just reached out to them on LinkedIn. Um, but I was also lucky that um, I had a lot of some contacts through um, my um, thesis advisor, Sophia, um, because she knows a lot of people in the industry, so she was able to give me emails and then I reached out directly to them and said, hey, um, PR recommended me uh, to contact you, so um, what do you think, would you be interested in? Um, being participant of my research, and of course I will be happy, as a, as a thank you, I will be happy to share um, the research findings with you. How are design maturity models used at your current employment? Um, so we, in my current company, we don't use design maturity model, um, but um, there is a lot of activities to increase design maturity. Um, yeah, that's maybe what I would say. Um, is there a company with the highest like, strategic level of the UX maturity which doesn't focus on creating design tools, design resources? Um, <coughs> I'm trying to understand the question. Um, so if I understand, it's about if, there, if I know a company that is really uh, doing a lot in terms of um, that, that is really design nature, but doesn't create resources about it. Um, fr from the companies that I personally know, um, I would say that, well, the, the company of my advisor, Opa, that they, I think they are really uh, doing well in this, but they have produced some resources about this. Um, I would say some of the companies, they were progressing, they were not like maybe on the highest steps, but they were progressing quite high and they haven't done any um, publications about it. But um, of course my participants, they were anonymous, so I cannot mention the specific names of the companies. Um, care to compare a bit the design market here with Finland or Netherlands? Um, so I don't have that much understanding of the Dutch uh, design market because I haven't worked there as a designer. And in Finland, I have some understanding from uh, my thesis and from where I currently work, but also it's maybe quite specific because it's about um, the in-house companies. Um, I would say that um, in any country you have companies with really low design maturity. So even if maybe, I would say that in Finland there are companies that maybe like for example, Ope who have really high design maturity, um, maybe I would struggle to find similar company in Czech with 
the same size of the design team. Um, but still, I would say in every every country you have companies with low design maturity. Um, but in general, I would say in Finland, you probably can find companies that have higher design maturity and that um, have invested in design more than in Czech. Um, what about decreasing the design maturity? I always hear about increasing it, but how to keep it and prevent the decrease? Um, for example, a change in the top management, reorganization, etc. Good question. Honestly, I'm also interested in uh, the answer to this. Um, I know that uh, in OPE, they, when I was discussing with this PR, they said that they got to really high level, but then once they got quite high, they struggled with you know keeping it that way. So um, I haven't discussed this in my interviews, and yeah, I'm also interested in this. Uh, did you encounter any good courses for the top executives, CDOs, CEOs, to educate them about design? Um, from what I understood um, in the in my research, talking to the ten design leaders, it's mostly about personal relationships and um, talking to these people and working together. Um, I am not aware of any like formal education or some specific courses that you could um, send them to. So, yeah. Do you think that the same design maturity models can be applied to organization of any size, from startups to international corporates? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, yeah, each company is very different, and um, the design maturity models need to be taken with a pinch of salt. And I talked to some people who created their own custom. Um, design maturity models because, um, for example, the size of the company was quite small, so some of the things uh, were not relevant because the, the model was aimed at a bigger company, so it was not relevant. So they created their own model. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's it's one size fits all, and that was also the argument for a lot. Um, the main argument from a lot of my respondents that they said we don't use these models because we don't. They are too simple. We think they don't. They never can fit the complexity of the reality, um, which is to some extent true. But I think that still um, you can use them and uh, gain some benefit from that, even if it's if it even though it will never be like exactly representation of the reality because it's a simplification. Are you keen to present the kiosk project next time? <laughs> um, if you are really interested in that, uh, I think you can find um, more about that on my uh, personal website. I think I have a case study about that. Um, or just contact me if you want to know more. Um, not sure if you already mentioned, but how did you come to design maturity as a topic for your uh, master's uh, MA dissertation? Can you describe the background? Um, I talked about it in the beginning, so you can maybe watch the recording. Um, why did you choose to focus on design leaders? Uh, do you think it could bring some interesting insights to include team members to the sample? That's a really good question. Um, I focused on them because I believe they are the ones who have the biggest potential to make an impact. To They have the biggest potential to increase design maturity because they are the ones usually who is in the contact with the top management. Um, and they are in charge of the whole design department, so basically they are at the steering wheel. Um, so that's why I thought that they are the most relevant people to talk to. Um, and as it turned out in my research, they're also the ones more concerned with this. Uh, often the, re uh, the, um, the designers themselves, they are maybe not that much invested in this topic, so. Why did you choose to focus, oh yeah, sorry, beer time, let's go. <laughs> yeah.